very warm welcome to this discussion, which is a key part of the World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Summit. My name is Sally Bundock, and I'm going to be steering you through this session, and it's absolutely uh, jam-packed. We've got some fantastic contributors all lined up to share their skills and expertise. Just to tell you, and you can see them all there, and I'll introduce you to them in just a moment, but just to tell you a little bit about me, um, I work for BBC News, as you can see, and if you are an early riser European time, and I do appreciate you all connecting from all over over the world, but you'll catch my programme on BBC World News. It's one hour, it's live, it's packed with all the news, latest news, business and sport. And when I say early hours, for me, it means my alarm this morning went off at 1.50am and I was in the newsroom in London at 3 a.m. And uh, I know, pretty shocking, but hey, makeup covers all, all the issues. And uh, my area of specialism is business and finance. And so the discussion that we're going to have now this afternoon uh, has been a key talking point, I have to say, with many of the chief executives, politicians and leaders that I've been interviewing in recent weeks on BBC World News. We're talking about the world of work, the dramatic changes the global pandemic has forced, if you collide that with climate change and also bring in the uh, disruption of automation, you've got what many would argue is a triple whammy, which whether we like it or not, is transforming the world of work. So today, as you just saw there, we have a great set, set of panellists who are going to share their thoughts and expertise. And um, also, I just want to mention that this discussion we're having, this first part, is an open discussion. So what that means is uh, we uh, would love to hear from you. So please get involved via the chat uh, messaging app at the section at the bottom. You hit the button, send us your questions and your thoughts and your comments, and we'll bring them through into the discussion as well. And also do share far and wide on social media the fact that we are having this conversation. Some of the key points that are made, uh, the hashtag to use is SDIS21. Uh, um, so that's all to come. But as you can see, we have got uh, three fantastic panellists who are waiting to share their expertise. So we've got Robert Moritz, who is the chairman of PwC, who I must admit I have interviewed many times in the early hours on a cold balcony in Davos at the World Economic Forum. Um, and of course, his uh, his remit is well and truly overflowing at PwC, but also he's very actively involved with WEF, which includes initiatives to do with the future of work and education. So, Bob, great to have you with us this afternoon. We've also got uh, Dan Rosenswig, who is president and chief executive of the company Check. This is a student services company based in California. I hope I've got that right, Dan. He's also an investor in many Silicon Valley uh, companies as well and is involved in several initi initiatives that encourage mentoring and workplace equality. So, Dan, great to have you on board. And we have uh, Soon Ju Goog, who is joining us from Singapore. Uh, it's late in the evening for Soon Ju. She is Chief Skills Officer and Chief Research officer at the Skills Future in Singapore. She leads a team of jobs, skills analysts, data scientists and futurists to identify global trends that impact business, jobs and skills. So we're going to have a discussion now for a period of time. As I've mentioned, it's an open discussion. This will be recorded and available later as well for you to watch again or to spread far and wide. But just to mention after this, we've got a very interactive phase two of this session uh, where we'll all be set, moved into breakout rooms. And during that session, that's more of a private discussion where Chatham House rules will apply. But for now, let's begin with uh, the panel conversation. And as I said, we really want to hear from you, those of you who are tuning in from all over. We want to get your comments and your questions in, so do get them sent to us. So first of all, Bob, if I uh, start with you and uh, we begin with, from your perspective, what are the most promising approaches for upskilling and by that we can look at you know post pandemic activity what's going going on across different industries where have you seen 
promising approaches to that challenge. Sally, thanks first for moderating the conversation, and I'm thrilled to be doing this not in the frigid zone of <laughs> Davos, Switzerland, in the early part of every calendar year. Uh, but coming back to your question, first, let's start with a statement. The world of work has to work better for everybody. And what the last 18 months has definitely demonstrated is that we've got to evolve and collectively work across the entire ecosystem to make it actually work better for everybody on a more inclusive basis. So what are the things that we see as promising? First, there's a hell of a lot more awareness. The divisiveness that has come in terms of the haves and have nots becomes painfully obvious. Second, the ability to see that it is possible to change, change the way we do work from an in-office approach to a hybrid approach to a totally digital approach shows it is possible to change the way we think about things. So that's another positive that's come through. With that, though, obviously, is the challenge of COVID, right? We've got a really crowded agenda now as people think about what are the various challenges they've got to deal with. So it really requires sort of three fundamental things. First, the time and attention of government, business, community leaders, and educators coming together collectively to work this across the entire ecosystem. When we see that happen in various countries, and we'll talk about Singapore in a few seconds with the rest of the panel, there's great examples where business and government come together very well. The second part I would say where we see things working really well is when we bring our youth into the equation. India is a great example of that. We're part of an organization called Generation Unlimited. In that case, it's an offshoot for UNICEF. We're focused on four things. One is connectivity to make sure people have access. Second is the quality and content of the education that goes to the curriculum that's being provided, which we know when you look at those two things, it's been challenging in the world at the lower level of education and the higher level of education. Third is the issue of entrepreneurship, making sure we actually have jobs that our skills can be used against. In the developing part of the world right now, that's actually not as big of a challenge. In the developing parts of the world, it is a big challenge. So making sure we've got a focus on entrepreneurship and the changing way work will be done is going to be important. And last but not least is bringing youth to the equation. We actually have youth champions in India and in the Gen U organization where they're actually the ones driving the change. They're activating it, bringing it to life, working with educators, business, and government. So the combination of all those things, Sally, is super important to get to the positive outcome we're looking for, which goes to how do we have the impact on the most people possible to get them skilled for the work of the future, whatever that may be looking like. And we cannot predict what it's going to look like. So agility is really important in this part of this process. Okay, super. Thank you, Bob. Soonju, you're nodding away there. Um, what are you seeing doing in Singapore that would you know, show us examples of promising approaches to upskilling? Mm, th thank you, uh, Bob, for the sharing. And thank you, Sally, for the question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, loud and clear. Okay. Yeah, us? great. Um, um, I would say that looking at the questions, I would caution us not to get uh, uh, distracted by the word post-COVID, yep. and we can't kind of think that we're going back to the typical normal business as usual. I would say that the, the post-COVID actually gave us a great opportunity. In, in fact, we have seen a lot of innovation, as Bob mentioned. Um, a lot of the organization has done away with... Uh, processes that required human 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 to perform and they have automated that and, and they has reduced that the kind of labor depend, dependence to do work processes and, and, and the automation is really really exciting. So I thought we when we look at the post-COVID uh, industry across industry reskilling, we should always have that uh, uh, beyond recovery to the old to a more transformative future and to seize the opportunity to make sure that whatever we, we reskill is to is for the future future the economy where the, there is sustainable growth. So I thought that is a very important point for me to put across, not to go back to the old, but to really support the reskilling for the future, and, and to do that um, to, to reskill um, the reskilling for the future economy. I think we really need to uh, think through what are the kind of uh, where are the feasible and reasonable uh, uh, jobs uh, allow people to pivot from a sunset industry to sunrise industry, and that, that require a lot of coordinations and planning um, from with that industry, in, with industry, with the businesses, 
with trade association, association and chamber and with a uh, university polytechnic, all the education is still coming together and, and some of the workforce intermediary. And that part is really important because we cannot have good policy without good implementation. So I think that is key. And I think thirdly is really to think through the kind of support provision, support provision we need to put in place, be it a financial support to help people tie over during the reskilling period, or the kind of incentive we're going to put on the table to nudge the enterprises to move towards a sustainable future. Yeah, thanks. Um, could you, Sunju, just explain in Singapore how your organisation works? I presume you work with government. I know you've worked in the Singaporean government in the past. So how, how does the collaboration work and how long has, you know, the skills future, sure. how, how hmm. long has that been going on for? Yeah, Skills Future Singapore, we are a government agency under the Ministry of Education. So we are, um, if you put it that way, we are a skill, a skills authority of Singapore. So we identify the emerging skills and future skills need of the economy, and then we translate it into training programs. We work with organizations like Coursera. Uh, we work with organizations like Generations to, as an intermediary to see how can programs and, and um, be, be available to the citizens for for transitions or to help organize, to help enterprises identify um, talent and skills needs. So we do, do this ongoingly with or without COVID. Uh, but during COVID, I think there was a, a, a time that we need to quickly ramp up training and traineeships uh, to help to hold um, a fresh grad from the market because last year the class of 2019 was badly hit. I think class of 2020 is slightly better. So I think we have to think through how to help how, uh, 2020 is badly hit as well. So I think we need to think through how to uh, create job opportunity very quickly uh, over, over, over a short period of time. And we also uh, use big data to look into uh, where are the, what are the in-demand jobs that we can transit people over, uh, including creating uh, skills profiling tools to profile people so that they can understand these are the nearest adjacent job that they can go into very quickly and also help the employer to see where, where else can they find uh, Sometimes to land the, land the staff out if they have access uh, resources and manpower, how to land the people out to other industry very quickly. So these are kind of some of the things that we do on, on reskilling efforts. Yeah. Okay. And and how long have you know have you there uh, existed as an organisation working with government specifically looking at skills like this? I mean, how many years have you been operating? Um, as as Skill Future Singapore uh, uh, since 2016. But if you look back the history. Uh, we, the 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 fall body of uh, Skill Future Singapore was Workforce Development Agency. That was in 2003. And if you look at the history of Singapore, we've been we have been looking at workforce reskilling since the day we the nation is created. So it's about 50 over years. Really it's quite incredible and unusual. I mean, can you give examples of other governments around the world that have something similar in place? Mm, I would say that. Uh, we are quite unique in the way that because we see our Singapore citizens as valuable assets, that every one of the citizens must have a, a fulfilling career. And to help them have a fulfilling career um, in, in various uh, life stages, therefore, we, we invest a lot of a substantive amount of uh, resources to make sure that we have free educations from primary, secondary to uh, tertiary. So tertiary are highly funded uh, by university is at least 70%, and then there are bursary. Um, so I think that's a front end part of pre-education and, and training. But the, the lifelong learning part is even um, uh, causing us more resources because everybody as a Singaporean, for example, for 25 years and above, you have skill future credits that you can defray out of pocket expenses for your lifelong learning. And the curated courses, which is a, uh, which is, based on what the, the future economy will need are highly subsidized as well from 70% to 90%, depend, depends on your, depend on the profile of the workforce. I think at the end of the day, we want to ensure that economic growth does cascade down to individuals, citizens, uh, career uh, success, and also supporting a competitive economy. Okay, thank you. That's really a, a really good illustration of collaboration between government, between business, between society. Dan, uh, give us your take on this. I mean, you 
not only run CHEG, which is specifically supporting students, providing services for students, which is the future workforce, but also you uh, invest in lots of Silicon Valley companies. You've got your, you know, you've got your eye on a lot of organizations. So from your perspective, what are the promising approaches? The question I've put to the other two, you know, for post-pandemic upskilling across industry. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Sally, and, and I appreciate all the comments that have been made already. I think they're spot on and, and very constructive and laying out sort of the giant framework. The thing that, that we see is this. The, the pandemic just accelerated the inevitable. It didn't cause this problem. Um, what, what hasn't been said explicitly, and I'm just going to say it, is all of the economies around the world are becoming tech-enabled. And that doesn't mean everybody has to be an engineer. It just means everybody has to understand and utilize technology in whatever role that they happen to be playing. So if you're in sales and you can't use Salesforce, you're not likely to be able to be successful in the role of sales going forward. If you're in the creative world and you can't use Adobe, then you're not likely going to be successful. And so I think we have to first acknowledge a couple of things that we need that the system of education is no longer aligned with its primary constituents, which are the students, who 80% of them, if they choose to go on to higher education, are going on for the purposes of getting a better career. So we have to look at the cost of education. We have to look at the way education is delivered. In-person education in a world where the overwhelming majority of people have families and have jobs while they're learning no longer can serve the constituency that it needs to conserve uh, to serve at scale. So we have to look at the cost of education, the way education is delivered, the curriculum that's delivered, the length of time it takes to get a so-called degree. The fact of the matter is, if you just look at the United States as an example of the first world country that people think are doing extraordinarily well, 50% of high school students go on to higher education and almost half of them never get a degree. So 75% of the U.S. population doesn't even have a college degree. So the question is, what should we be learning? How should we be learning it? How long should it take? And how do we realign the learner with the ultimate consumer of that learning, which are businesses? And so institutions, whether they're government institutions or educational institutions or businesses, need to realign with the future of work. We don't really need big data to tell us what jobs are growing. We can see it. We can see what companies are opening up. We can see they're all tech-enabled in nature. And again, you don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to learn to code. You don't have to do those things. In fact, software is being built, so you never have to learn to code. But if you're not able to utilize the tools of the modern workforce, you're not going to be able to be skilled, upskilled or reskilled. And we have, you know, people running the panels later who do all of those things extraordinarily well. And so you see the majority of growth of where learners are going is either direct to learn it themselves because government or institutions are not really creating the right curriculum or they're going into the workforce. So 60% of the people have jobs. They can work with the great companies like Coursera, Udacity and others to get skilled in the workplace. But for the people that don't have jobs or don't have companies that provide that, it needs to be low cost, on demand, and it needs to have actual support that can scale with them so that when they get stuck, they can get unstuck. The two primary reasons people drop out of, of learning is because they can't afford it or they get stuck and there's nobody to get them unstuck. And so we just, what we see from the students and Chegg now is global. We were domestic U.S. for a long time, but you know we've, we've been discussing the fact that we'll have well over a million subscribers for Chegg help outside the U.S., and we have our Thinkful organization, which focuses on upskilling, skilling, not so much reskilling. Reskilling is for the people that are being displaced now. Upskilling is for people who are in jobs, but the skills are evolving. And then there's just skilling, which is, K through 12, early learning should be skilling you in, jo in job capabilities. And I'm amazed that the curriculum of the institutions and the government don't focus on that. It's easier to learn it while you're young than to get reskilled when you're old. What we do know 
is technology will displace jobs faster than they've ever displaced them before. And that is tragic. And I agree that we need to find financial support for those people and education for those people. But the fact is, over the last 25 years, technology has actually created more jobs than existed before. They're just different kinds of jobs. And so we need to understand that skills that were appropriate 25 years ago, five years ago, may not be appropriate to be teaching now. And institutions, including the government, including education institutions, need to realign with the students' needs and businesses' goals. Okay, and, and whilst you've all been talking, we've been getting some questions through, which is great. So we'll start to bring those through. So Bob, if I throw this one at you, and, and, and to a degree, Dan, you've already touched on this actually, uh, so you've already answered it to a degree. But one watching us at the moment has asked the question, you know, who is responsible for developing skills, employer or individual, Bob? And actually, it's everyone, isn't it? It's employer, individual, business, community, etc. But the but when it's everyone, it's hard to, to get in, get stuck in, isn't it? Because everyone's looking to everyone else, aren't they? I think that's right. But let's go back to what it takes to actually do this, do this well, and do it in scale, as Dan was talking about. First, <clears throat> let's get a taxonomy created so we understand what kind of skills we're talking about, how to talk about them. We have the right nomenclature. And the WEF has done a lot of good work in this regard. Second, you've got to have accessibility to those credentialing capabilities, whether they come from a government or whether they come from a business organization, whether they come from an employer or a business that focuses on this as a specialization. And that's important in terms of, as Dan said, the quality of the curriculum and the effectiveness and efficiency in terms of the cost and the ease of which people can tap into that resource. So there's not only a mandate for them to do that, they're willing to actually jump into it themselves on a self-motivated basis. Which comes to the other piece you need, which is you gotta actually deal with the incentives. And this comes in two ways. Incentives for people to lean into these opportunities, incentives for businesses to do it. Now, I will tell you the business community should be self-incentized. Otherwise, you're not gonna have the employees or the talent you need to actually do the work of the future that is gonna be required of you. But you also have to need to find people the time to do this. I'll share with you, even when we did it for ourselves, the number one issue was, I have my day job. I want to reskill. I want to upskill. But the reality is I don't have time to do it. So you have to actually think about that as well as you look forward. And last but not least, you talked about who's, who's responsible. Well, let's go to the topic of accountability. This is where government should be really clear in terms of what they're planning on doing and are they accountable and have they delivered against those results. Likewise, business being accountable in terms of not only what they may do to help the skills, but the impact they are having from availing themselves to, or for letting people to be available to, the, to actually tap into those skills. So reporting is an equal amount of a tool that actually could be actually helping us get to that accountability and specifically that point, Sally, of who's responsible, who's doing it, and who's actually demonstrating the progress in a positive way. And you're starting to see that country by country and business by business in terms of the impact that it's looking to have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Dan, you've already touched on the fact that quite a few who will be leading discussions later, I mean, they're involved in, in businesses that are trying to help educators and organizations in terms of technology provision. But don't you think that, I, I certainly, I, my experience of the pandemic has been, I've got three children who are all at different schools at different ages. What COVID-19 did was it forced schools, certainly across the UK and I'm sure in many other countries, to suddenly get on board with technology because all the kids are at home. And, and that caused huge, you know, stress at the time, um, but, but massive progress in a very short period of time, would you say? Yeah, look, there has been progress. And as I said, Czech has been built to bet on the inevitable. There's a reason that we now have um, nearly, you know, approaching 10 million customers around the world in a company that most people haven't heard of. And it's because there are a lot of self-motivated people that need help and want help and will seek help. Employers are incented to have an educated workforce. Students and parents and governments are incented. It's the educational institutions that have never actually been held accountable for producing employable people. There's no accountability on the price. There's no accountability on the curriculum. So even though, yes, now they are using technology 
They didn't evolve the curriculum. They didn't evolve the speed in which they can teach the curriculum. They didn't start utilizing the tools in which to support students. They still haven't arranged it so that it can be on demand. I mean, if you just look at the United States as a singular example. 26% of all students already have children. We're, choosing, we're forcing people to choose between learning and earning. So it's not just that they use technology. They used it, at least in higher education, so that they can continue to collect the money as opposed to understanding what the technology can actually enable people to do, which is to learn for less, learn on demand, learn on scale, get personalized help. And so it's not just that they appreciate what technology can do. And just, just to give you a couple of quick, quick statistics, 75% of all students now that go to higher education say that they would prefer a hybrid environment, where only about 40% said that before COVID. So COVID did accelerate that. And nearly half of professors now agree that technology can be used to educate. However, the overwhelming majority of them are at vocational or two-year schools and not four-year schools because four-year schools still would prefer to be four years, not commit to full-time teaching, not make it on demand. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to go. So yes, progress has been made, but I think we need to understand the alignment is between the learner the employer and the institutions need to be in the middle to allow for those people to have the right curriculum at the right speed with the right credentials to be employable in the modern workforce and that there needs to be an affirmative ROI on the cost, whoever pays it. Chegg happens to believe employers should pay. We pay off all of our employees' student debt. We, we pay for continuing education, but there are many people that pay. Um, and, and so whoever pays is going to want to see a return on it. Okay, absolutely, I'm sure, for sure. Um, before we go to part two, Soonju, I just want to get one more comment from you because we've had a, a, a question in from, from someone who's, who's with us on this uh, discussion saying, how do you actually encourage people to want to reskill? And I mean, that, that is a big issue, isn't it? Mm. Th thanks for the question, Sally. Uh, yes, it is, it is a challenge. I, I would say that uh, even when we started to uh, issue out uh, in 2016, every 25-year-old and above Singaporean get $500 give you your credits. And in fact, last year, we just had another top power of $500. And for, for citizens 40 and above, we have another extra $500. So people like myself have $1,500 to spend. So having, having that um, um, credit in the pockets is kind of um, giving them the, the uh, empowerment to make decisions about what skills what kind of training they want to go for. And I thought uh, it somehow has, has moved the needle a bit, I would say, moved the needle a bit because people felt that, hey, I have the money, I have to spend within five years and I have to think carefully, uh, where should I invest my time? And, and with this money, what can I do in my career? This is number one. Number two, I thought uh, we, we use the term signposting. To us, signposting is quite important because it's not about just giving, giving out the money, but how do they know what is the skills demand? How do they know uh, where do they want to go? How do they know what kind of options they have? So I think the signposting from us is very important to explain to them that these are the various options in the care economy, in the digital economy, in the green economy, and you can, you can make certain decisions about where you want to go and then how much it's going to cost you, how much time it's going to involve. So at least you can see that with the investment, how far you can go with the next S-curve for your career. So I would say the incentive is important. A uh, signposting is important and equally important will be the kind of support, not just online that they can self-navigate on, on the portal that we have called MySkillWitcher portal, but make available face-to-face -face, um, over the, over the, they can, they can make appointment to talk to a career coach, to talk to a skills ambassador is available in Singapore. So we make all this available throughout the whole Singapore. People can just walk into a counter uh, 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 make appointment and, and have someone to talk to. I think that will allow us to, to encourage people to want to come forth uh, to, to um, participate in a, a reskilling on their own. On the other hand, is to, to encourage employers to continue to reskill their workforce because I think that's quite important. Employers play the role of identifying skills, develop skills, and use the skills, and, and more importantly, pay for the skill as well. So I think we need to, we need to be able to mobilize both the citizen, individual, and also the employers. Okay. All right, Soonju, thank you so much. So that 
brings to a close uh, part one of, of this session. So I just want to explain how the next part work. So uh, where we have been live streaming this so far, um, we'll be directed all of us into breakout rooms next. So this next part is a private discussion. It's very interactive. So just to remind you all that Chatham House rules will apply in this se next session. It'd be lovely for those of you whilst you're in the breakout rooms, do turn your cameras on so we can all see each other. And of course, remember to be muted or unmuting depending on what's going on. And your discussion leader in your breakout rooms will guide you through uh, the next exercise. So let me introduce to you who the discussion leaders are. We've got Andrew Baird, who's chief executive uh, for Education, sorry, the Chief Executive of Education for Employment. We've got uh, Gabriel Dal Porto, who's Chief Executive of Udacity. We've got Jeff Maggio and Calder, who's CEO of Coursera. Uh, company's already been mentioned. Many of these companies have been mentioned already. And we've got Dr. Mona Morshed, who's Chief Executive of Generation. So do enjoy uh, part two, get very involved, make the most of this time. We will reconvene uh, all of us a little later to just share what's been discussed in the breakout rooms. But for now, just wait as we pause for five minutes as we allow for that transition to take place. <laughs> 